because the average person doesn't relate or connect the dots that um, sales, it's uh, if you work in Tiffany's or you work even at a Rolls dealership, everybody that comes in the Rolls dealership, there's a higher probability of, other than I send you to go out and smell the leather and roses, which has fucked up the whole system here since we uh, uh, ordered the new Rolls. And uh, they know, all know about uh, smell the leather. Every Rolls dealer in, in England, in Scotland knows, there's only one in Scotland, knows about the fuck, because we had mooches like you That's one of our up-and-comers superstars office. His looks a little neater than most of them, with a little, tr that treadmill underneath, if you can notice. But he doesn't have a working desk. I don't know how he does it, but anyway, that's how he does it. Um, the, um, <clears throat> has everybody got their uh, uh, kilt and sh sh shit squared away? Anybody not have it squared away? I just need my shirt returned, my shirt. Well, make sure that you're telling somebody because well, this is, okay. This is the middle of no, this is kind of like being in Adelaide. It's the middle of nowhere. I mean, uh, even though uh, we, I don't even know what Amazon Prime means, but I think that means the same day delivery. Okay, well, we don't get the next week delivery. So, well, you, you going to the North Pole? You, are you sick? <laughs> Something wrong with you? Is, is that how you get dressed up when you're in the hospital? You know? Can't you just, how many have seen the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? <laughs> <laughs> Except, you know, I can just see him chasing nurse, uh, was it Ratchet or Hatchet, whatever her name was, the crazy nurse. Every group's got one. Every group has one comedian who's not funny, okay? One, every group has got one wacko. <laughs> this wacko, maybe he's the comedian too, I don't know, you know? Um, um, we're going to see uh, Jason Nagy later today um, and uh, see how laid back he is. Yet he's got he, uh, he's got a kind of laid back, and then he's got his his uh, QLA aggressive mode, where he gets all this shit done. Um, um, but one of the remember I said that after you do a few deals, your your board will lift their skirt up and start giving you contacts. And the more deals you do, the more contacts they'll give you. And then pretty soon, your role in that ninety five percent of your time chasing deals and chase money as you're chasing the leads that your board gives you and your accountants and lawyers but they want to see you perform because they're even though they want a billable hours and they want to be able to you know uh, take credit for your success they don't want to embarrass themselves because some of these guys have been doing this 20 25 30 years and you can go in like our young friend there uh, not that i'm suggesting he would do this he'd go in there and fuck up a relationship the guy had for 30 years not on purpose you know uh he's not goofy on purpose he's just goofy you know, so it, that doesn't make any difference. The guy that he's talking to doesn't know that he's not trying to do this to piss him off. You know, he just thinks that. So, but that's where Jason is now. And um, the, um, he has now, you know, a, a, uh, opened up, the not the floodgates, but he's opened up. Because it's hard, hard to imagine that big wave I showed you going through the middle of Australia. That's a little difficult. You know, when the world ends, if, if the water gets to Adelaide, uh, I, Everybody's gone. I mean, because he's got to travel a long, long, long way to get to Adelaide. But we're gonna we're gonna see him. We're also gonna see um, the two, two role plays with Josh Kim, one of which was with a uh, banker, and one of which is with a uh, uh, motivated seller. We're gonna see that. And again, the scripts that you have, the templates that you have, are verbatim. Well, you get three or four scripts, stroke templates for every scenario. And the idea is that you test all three or four which one, and that's why you practice with the little guys first, and then um, you figure out which one works for you, your personality, etc. A lot of the kids just go straight to Jay, or, uh, uh, Josh's, uh, although his personality isn't really like many people that come to the seminar, but they just uh, jump to, the, to him because they know that he's been super successful. Um, and the, uh, but some of the other uh, templates may work better for you. It also depends on where you are in the world. Every place isn't the same. New York City, uh, a low-key approach in New York City doesn't work. I mean, they're expecting uh, you to be a, maybe not a hammer closer like me, but uh, certainly not a finesse closer. Uh, uh, New York has been accused of a lot of things, and finesse isn't one of them, you know. And, but some, pl some places in the world, like London, is more finesse closing. They're more gentlemanly, okay? Marcus of Queensbury and all that shit, you know. Um, but... Um, 
you will find which one works for you. And uh, you will, you know, and you'll think, and the people that you're pitching will think, God damn, this guy's a smart guy. How does he know all this? And uh, Now, don't write it down. Now, I'm saying this, that sounds funny, but it's not a joke. Some of the kids have written, the because te- there's not many words in the template, and you can put seven or nine or 12 words, the keywords, and they write it on their hand. So when I'm talking to you, <laughs> and then when you shake hands with them, most of your hands are going to be wet because you're going to be nervous. And I tell you to dry your hands. Well, when you dry your hands, you smudge all the fucking words. <laughs> the reason I say all these things is because I've lived them. You know, we could have a comedy, a sitcom uh, about this program for all the things that the kids fuck up. <laughs> um, when I used to get ready to go in for a presentation, and uh, now I'm giving six, five, six, seven presentations a day. I mean, by the second or third day of the week, I'm especially since I'm all all night drinking, got a hangover, I run around uh, Hyde Park, or not Hyde Park, uh, Central Park twice. Um, by Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon, I'm a tired puppy. And so before I did it, go in the meeting, I'd get out of the elevator and I'd jump up and down and slap my face. You know how the, the MMA guys go like this to get blood in their muscles? Well, I do the same thing. And uh, I'd go into a meeting and but I'd hit myself so hard, I'd leave the hand marks on my face. And the guy said, are you all right? I mean, uh, looks like somebody smacked you or slapped you. Um, but um, just, you got to get your energy level up. I used to live on between 15 and 20 double espressos a day. Double espressos a day. So I'm drinking all night and I'm not eating anything. And so I'm living on 15 or 20 double espressos a day. And the uh, and double espressos wasn't enough caffeine. So I went from double, triple, quadruple espressos. But by the end of the week, the caffeine had a cumulative effect, you know. And um, my my boss uh, at that time uh, said, uh, Danny, uh, now they thought I was on drugs. And they says, uh, whatever you're taking, you're taking too much of it. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's coffee. And uh, But if I didn't take the caffeine or the espresso, I mean, uh, whatever that sleeping sickness is, they thought, uh, you know, but this is by Thursday or Friday because I'm, I'm, I'm tired out. Now, I should have like slept in Wednesday night, or, but I didn't do that because I was young and, and full of piss and vinegar, so I thought. The, um, but you're going to get these and you're going to find, and as uh, Mar- uh, Margot and uh, all the others have said, and um, although she's amused, she thinks it's funny that they work. I'm not giving you things selfishly. I'm not giving you things that don't work. But you may try the first template and for whatever reason, the part of the world you're in and that plus your personality uh, or lack thereof a personality, it didn't work. So try them all. And the first time you go through them and try them isn't going to be the same as by the third or fourth time you go through them because now you're getting more confidence. Certain things will click. And, uh, but believe me, I mean, they're, within the paperwork that you're going to get, the, um, one of the deals will work. And um, the, um, Dr. Joe alluded to it yesterday in his webinar. Um, there's two different, there's the, email, or there's the email, call, email, or call, email, call. I'm a call, email, uh, call guy. If I remember correctly, Whipple was a um, email, call, email. Um, the, uh, because I'm better on the phone than I am in writing. If I could get him on the phone for more than 15, 20, 30 seconds, I had him normally. I had him. Uh, either that or they hung up on me. Um, because you know how in a phone conversation, they'll, they'll start to end the conversation? Well, that didn't work with me. I just kept talking. And, um, and sometimes they hung up on me. Then I'd call back and they'd hang up on me. And then they wouldn't answer the phone. And then they'd block the number. You can still block numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, see, I think I thought that was funny. Most people don't handle rejection that way. If uh, they slam the phone down and say, go fuck yourself, I mean, uh, not that you're that sensitive, but um, when they've done that 500 times, it, it has a toll. Um, but uh, the, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's pure and simple. I was talking to uh, the insurance guy uh, last night, and I have fond memories of selling door to door. I have fond memories of, uh, you know, getting doors slammed on my face. <laughs> The uh, because I I only have farmers because I ultimately figured out how to do it and made a lot of money. If I was just a guy that left the, those doors with my tail between my legs and I never sold anything, then I wouldn't I wouldn't be explaining this to you now. But very few of the guys that are teaching sales have sold door to door. I mean, I've sold cars. That's a, you know, and that's when I say a used car salesman is one or two levels uh, uh, above a, a business broker, which is more or less the, the lowest level, but the lowest level of sales of all the world is a landman. A landman is a guy that sells leases, petroleum leases for people 
I'm a farmer. I have 10,000 acres. He comes to me and he buys my mineral rights. Uh, and then he goes and sells the mineral rights to Exxon or whoever. And he normally sells the mineral rights more than once because the odds are 88 or 89 percent of all wells that are drilled are dry. So I can sell your mineral rights 10 times and there's only a 10 percent chance that somebody's going to make a well. And um, old man Hunt, who uh, the original Hunt, the Dallas Fort Worth Hunt, because there's two Hunt families, one in Louisiana, he had a second family in Louisiana, brought in the West Texas oil field near Midland and Odessa uh, back in the 30s. He had sold uh, the rights 100 times. And uh, when the well came in, now he's got 99 people. He's got to go fucking run around and buy the lease back. And he and, and uh, the discovery of the West Texas oil field uh, spread like wildfire. And uh, so he got to the first five or six or seven people to buy the lease back. But then the other 85 or 90, he was fucked. OK, and so he may have uh, uh, sold the lease to you for three dollars an acre and he had to buy it back for one hundred and three dollars an acre. And um, the uh, but uh, and we had a landman here last year and now they don't call him landman. They call him <coughs> petroleum discovery engineers or some horse shit. But it's a landman. You're uh, buying and selling uh, mineral rights. And he says the business hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Uh, but now uh, a lot of leases that we sold or allegedly a lot of leases people sold uh, before fracking was invented on that same acreage. And the, and the lease normally runs for a term. Five years, 10 years, 25 years. Well, towards the end of the lease term, these assholes came up with fracking. And now all those worthless leases that we've sold and resold many times are now very productive. So legend has it, there are people running around like old man Hunt did 70, 80 years before trying to buy back these leases. But anyway, so for those of you that have direct sales experience, it's better. It'll, you'll get through it. But as the young high school kid said, after you make two or three hundred calls, in the beginning, you, be, you get numb. The first 50, 150 calls, you get numb, numb. You know, you're kind of in shock, battle fatigue. And then once you get beyond that, um, then it's just, it's just numbers. And now nobody picks up a phone. I understand that. I do. I used to pick up. I used to run a, uh, you would call it a call center. I, and when I day, my day when we, I ran when it was called a boiler room. Just like in the Wolves of Wall Street, a boiler room. I had 400 or so guys smiling and dialing, as they used to say. And when I met you, I, uh, I did all the interviewing. And I used to sit on a table about this high and I could see over the tops of the heads of the 400, 350, 400 people smiling down. And so I'd interview and I'd say, um, okay, this is your experience, blah, blah, you sold door to door, that's good. What hand do you uh, wipe your ass with? Now this is in the early 70s. And they look at me and they say, my right hand. So then I take the phone, a phone in those days, right? And I tape it with masking tape to their hand, right? And so if I didn't see that masking, we had big, heavy light, lights. The light, if I didn't see it shining off your motherfucking hand, Boom, I'm on you like the flash, you know. They used to have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. We made tens of millions. This is the early 70s. We had the, remember, I closed at 95%. The, uh, the worst salesman in the room closed 30% because everybody around him was closing. And we used to pin $100 bills to the ceiling with scotch tape. The first guy to make a sale, he normally had to jump up on the table and then put one foot on your shoulder to reach the $100 bill. But we have people collapsing on each other, jumping for the $100 bills. We used to have sales meetings and Friday nights where we bought, you know, 15, 20, 30 uh, uh, buckets, not pitchers of margaritas. And we used to pay commissions in cash, in cash. Nothing works better than cash on the spot. Of course, the accountants, the IRS. And everybody else didn't like that because our, what are we withholding? In most cases, we weren't withholding anything. Okay, enough about the scripts. Um, you saw last night the, the father of the program, uh, who's from Dunfermline, uh, Scotland, Andrew Carnegie, um, who, depending on what story you want to believe, either when he was 7 or 11 or 12, he either stowed away to come to the United States in the belly of an old ship, or he came with his father, who had gone out of business because uh, they had to close down all the looms in, in the town. But w whatever s story you want to believe, and there's derivatives or uh, variations of the story in between the two that I just pointed out, uh, he became a phenomenally successful guy. And he was about five feet, well, some people say he wasn't five feet tall, but maybe he was five two or five one or something like that. He was small in stature, but big in balls, big in balls. Uh, comments about, uh, yes, sir. So I didn't know about Daniel Carnegie uh, until you told me about him in January on this uh, London, and um, I researched a little bit. Oh fuck! 
Well, yeah, okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so, so I think that's, that's. Did I lie about him? No, you no, no. Okay. Normally, when you when you're gonna uh, double, you're gonna check facts. It's because you don't believe the asshole that told you the facts. Okay, go ahead. So there's a figure in pop culture who is really like him. So this Uncle Scrooge, so the uncle of Donald Duck. Yeah. You know, I think it's really similar. And Did you get this thing? Yeah. Yes. You pass him out. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And uh, you know, and Ayn Rand, this. Uh, Ayn Rand. Yeah. Sure. I don't know her, but I know who she is, yeah. And also, so the industrial... Anne Rand wrote a book, uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged, uh, and it's, well, anyway, go ahead. So the industrialist she's talking about is also really like him. So uh, there was these two things in my mind, like this Andrew Scrooge and me from my childhood, and also this uh, industrialist from Anne Rand, and I had the feeling that it's all coming. Well, I mean, the, um, a lot of those guys during that time frame knew each other. Um, I mean... There was supposedly, and when uh, Andrew Carnegie, as legend has it, told uh, Napoleon Hill, I'm going to introduce you to the 500 most rich people in the world. Maybe that, uh, those probably were the 500, I won't say only rich people in the world, but you know, those are uh, mega wealthy people, and they all knew each other. Uh, the, uh, they used to uh, uh, go back and forth across the Atlantic on the old Queen Mary, the old ship where they had, like in the Titanic, the movie The Titanic. Um, the um, in the in those days they weren't traveling by uh, plane because they didn't weren't, weren't any. The Wright brothers hadn't come up with the deal yet, but they were traveling by uh, boat uh, across the continent, uh, across the water, and uh, by train on uh, you know when they're on land. Uh, what else about uh, yes? Sir? I'm not finished. Oh, so, uh, okay. What I think you sounded like you were finished. Okay, go ahead. So what I think is really interesting is that uh, so he had a lot of employees later on, right? So if, Carnegie, yeah. yeah and uh, as soon as we are going to be successful, we also have quite a lot of employees at one point in time. So uh, what he, what this story yesterday was about was also this, this fight of, uh, between the employees and the employer. And I think this is something you should also be prepared for. Something. And all those guys of that era had uh, what you would call uh, in today's uh, uh, jargon, uh, human resource problems. <laughs> Uh, they all did, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Ford uh, beating them with uh, axe handles to, um, you know, the uh, when the union started, it was the right idea to try to, and as I mentioned yesterday, to try to get the guys a, a fair day's wage so they could support their families. That was the principal idea behind unions when they got started. And there was certainly need because a lot of the employers uh, took advantage. Uh, but um, Henry Ford, one, the first guy, went from, you know, beating his employees with axe handles and hiring uh, people, and they hired the Pinkertons, most of them, which is the Scottish, the first Scottish private eye firm. Uh, and the Scots haven't changed in 150 years. They would still rather beat you with fucking axe handle, you know. Uh, of course, they were the picks that the Romans never could conquer. That's why they built uh, Hadrian's Wall. So the Scots have been a pain in the arse, as they say, for centuries, thousands of years. Nothing's changed, you know, okay? And of course, me living here, uh, I feel right at home because I've been a pain in the ass, you know, for uh, almost all my 70 years. So those guys um, the, um, treated the employees uh, uh, harshly. But Ford went from beating them to then he paid them. He was the first guy to pay him, I think, seven bucks a day, which was considered uh, some sort of living wage. And he allowed them payments to buy cars. His real reason for raising their salary so he could sell more cars. Because he had thousands of people on the assembly line. Uh, but that normally gets lost in the story that he was just, uh, he, he saw the air of his ways as he got older. Um, what else about Carnegie? Yes, sir. Leadership. He was a little bit selfish in his ways. Not a little bit selfish. He was, all these guys, if there was one word to describe what I want you to how, change in your life, just one. Uh, not laser beam focus, not the, the ones that stay the longest. Hey, okay. That's all rhetoric horseshit. Selfish. Be more selfish. Selfish with your time, with your assets, assets, your resources. All these guys are selfish. All of them. And almost all of us have been raised as some kids. Don't be selfish. Share your toys. Say this. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Himmler here wasn't raised that way. He was raised to be selfish. Question. Yeah, but that's, that's exactly my question is, if, he's really, if he was really that selfish in a way, because he really softened up and he was getting an elderly person, he really softened up. He softened up as he got, got old. Yeah, and also uh, during this union fights, he also, I think he also delegated a lot of, of the tough work uh, to Frick. Yeah, well, I mean, I want you to always have plausible deniability. Pla wait, 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 okay. Plausible deniability means that's why when the president or the prime minister has you go do shit, it's you doing shit. And actually, you 
to hire him and him to do the shit. So then when I ask you, well, yeah, I don't know anything about it. And then I can obviously say as president or prime minister, I don't know anything about it. It's plausible deniability. When Carnegie and the guys, as they uh, got older and they, just, uh, they figured out plausible deniability, meaning that when they were interviewed and asked, uh, did you do such and such? They could say, well, no, I have no, rec I have no knowledge of that. Um, and, w uh, and, and that's part of the beauty of delegation. I'm not telling you to, to, to uh, shun your responsibility, but everything that, uh, that um, your managers, um, I believe that the ends justify the means as long as it's moral, ethical, and legal. No matter what you do, as long as it's moral, ethical, and legal, justify the means. Now, morality and ethics swing in the wind depending where you are in the world. But the law is the law, and that's why I jump up and down and stamp my feet to tell you, you got to be where there's a rule of law. You, the German guys, there's a rule of law. You may not like the rule of law, but there's a rule of law. And if somebody, you know, uh, tampers with your uh, business or tries to cheat you on a contract, you can go to court and, and pretty easily get it uh, resolved. resolved. Um, but there are places that that's not possible. Or it's so expensive, the guy that has the most money almost always wins. Uh, but there, there's still portions in, in the South and the United States that um, you can get what they call a, a, a local guy uh, can win out uh, because the judge is his cousin and the jury is half of his family is on the jury uh, in, in uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, West Virginia. I mean, there's, I mean, everybody's related to everybody. Um, the, um, but uh, for the most part, that's not true. So what you say uh, is true. What else about Carnegie? Okay, you wanted to say something. Uh, he started to collapse after he married Lewis, or like he started his business started going down. Well, he lost interest. Yeah. He went crazy, not crazy, uh, but he went uh, bonkers when he decided, decided to start giving all his money away because he couldn't. Uh, well, he could, but I mean, he never got to the point where he gave all his money away. In Dunfermline, Scotland, about 30, 40 miles south of here, I mean, uh, every, not everything, but almost every single thing in all those towns around there has got something to do with Andrew Carnegie because he donated the money. He donated the money a lot, of, uh, lot in the United States. Um, when Napoleon Hill interviewed Andrew Carnegie uh, back in 1919, um, he, um, he said then that uh, there was only three people that weren't, that we call it today work-life balance. Uh, then they called it uh, uh, something else, but it, it meant work-life balance. It was three out of 500, had peace of mind. Only three out of 500 people had peace of mind of all those 500 people. Uh, the ones that didn't have peace of mind or had peace of mind towards the end was uh, Carnegie, um, Burroughs, and one other. Edison. Pardon? Edison. Yes, thank you. Um, so 497 out of 500 were psycho beasts. That's a pretty small fraction, three out of 500. And, uh, but you don't have to be the psycho beasts, you know, that they lock up like uh, the kid here when he goes back to his hospital room. Uh, but you gotta be, remember, it's either if you're not tough, the dream team, the collective's gotta be tough. What else about Carnegie? Yes, sir, in the back. He was doing pure fuel and buying revenue all the time. Correct. And the little bastard figured out that uh, taking in equity investors, they didn't call them, they called them investors in those days. His ownership was going to be diluted and he didn't want it to be diluted. And so he used commercial debt, commercial debt. And he used it, you know, uh, not perfectly, but um, he was the first guy to figure this out. And when he sold out to JP Morgan uh, for 450 million or whatever it was, uh, he really, and, and, and legend has it, uh, years later, or months later, uh, J.P. Morgan says, you know, I would have paid whatever you asked. Uh, and of course, if I would have been at Carnegie, I'd, I'd, I'd have seller's remorse. Whatever I wanted, well, fuck, I really wanted two billion, you know, and I settled for 450 million. But 450 million back in those days was not all the money in the world, but almost all the money in the world. Um, and he, um, he, he invented or initiated or started, you know, at least one industry, the steel industry. Uh, arguably, some people say that he, uh, you know, he enhanced the railroad industry way beyond uh, what it should have been at that, during that same time frame. Uh, and then he enhanced endowments uh, for education because he was one of the first of the, those guys, uh, the Vanderbilts, etc., the Rockefellers, to uh, put up money uh, for uh, education. But when they put up the money for those schools to start, they were more or less following the paths of the, the big contributors. But 100 years later, they don't teach anything that those guys believed in. I mean, zero, because I, I spoke. 
spoken at uh, a good many of them. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Yeah. Um, as soon as he got competition uh, from uh, steel manufacturers that were better than him, he forced the lie and convinced all the railroads that they were not uh, correct. Too correct uh, yeah, correct steel, and then he bought them out. Correct. Yeah. Now. Uh, the story when the, um, the, the, the railroads met in the, cent- uh, the middle of the United States um, and they f- uh, the famous paintings that they drove the last spike in to join the east to the west. Well, the gauge that came from the east, the railroad gauge, and the gauge that came from the west weren't the same. So when they got within about a mile of one another, they saw that the eastern gauge was about this high and the western gauge was about that high. So they, they didn't have time to go back and lay all that track. But they did, for the mile or two on each side of the middle of the United States, lay the tracks so it looked like it, it meshed. But the trains couldn't go across all the way because they had different uh, gauge. I mean, uh, you'd think with the engineers that, that they would have figured that out. But uh, you can never underestimate how wrong you can be. Uh, yes, sir. So back to selfishness, it was interesting to see. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have to remind me about being selfish. Believe me, okay. there's a lot of things you might remind me of, but that's not one of them. Go ahead. In, in during his life, he's, the way how he dealt with his mentor, with his partners, with his manager, with their workers, everywhere. It's all about him, him, him. Him, him. And remember when his mentor uh, uh, needed him, and he says, you know, he didn't help him. Uh, yeah, but what, what should he have done? So he, he would he, he would have bankrupted his own business. No, I'm not justif- I don't have to justify what he did, but that that's his life. He did the right thing for himself. I, I couldn't agree more. And when your brother um, comes to you or your cousin, a cousin that you liked with his hand out, and you're living in a penthouse or a 25,000 square foot house, wherever you are, okay? I already know what most of you are going to do. I already know. The wrong thing. The wrong thing. And I already know what your, if your mother's still alive, what she's going to tell you to do. Or even maybe beg you to do. The wrong thing. Um, one of the only religious things quasi-religious things I say is God helps those who help themselves. That's it. And um, but like I told you yesterday and the day before, you're going to have more people think you will not remember all the people that are going to be on your doorstep. Remember, I, we were in the third grade together. Remember, we went to university. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, remember, we were in, uh, well, they won't be saying this. We skied at Zermatt uh, the, uh, in 2013 or whatever. whatever probably not too many of those. Um, and then, you know, you, that's why these guys have people to shield them, uh, gatekeepers. In the old days, uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, arguably the, the, the best lady entrepreneur that made the money for herself that the world's ever known, uh, she couldn't say no. To, uh, I mean, she went through a lot of her money supporting shit deals. Back in the old days, if you, had, if you were black and had a deal that was worth a the shit, there was only two people you needed to go see. One, Oprah. Two, Bill Cosby. Now, Bill Cosby's fallen off the, um, that list for a, a lot of obvious reasons, um, but those are two people. Um, in the old days, uh, there, were, uh, there were two ultimate sources of finance for third world kind of deals. International Monetary Fund, World Bank. You didn't have to go beyond that, beyond that. That was it. If it was worth a shit, I mean, if the deal was any good and there were some decent chances, that's where you went to get the money, to get the money. Um, but now there's plethora, a whole bunch of other financial institutions. And remember, all money just doesn't come from banks. A couple of you hit upon it in the last couple of days. Insurance companies, uh, uh, hedge funds lend money at owner's rates, but there's a lot of different ways uh, to, to get the money. But the one thing that I do say, every single deal uh, has got some person that will fund it on the planet. You just got to look hard enough. You gotta, the, there was a, a deal on a commercial on British television right now about uh, an entrepreneurial day that really has been successful. And it's two uh, girlfriends that were girlfriends in school together. And they, um, and, uh, they made a hundred financial presentations. And uh, on the BBC, uh, or it might have been, yeah, I think it was BBC News, the, the presenters, you can tell, um, hundred presentations. That means you made, you had 99 no's. What an Einstein, yeah, yeah. They, they sold the hundredth person, yeah, they had 99 no's. And they just couldn't believe it. Because the average person doesn't relate or connect the dots that um, sales, it's uh, if you work in Tiffany's or you work even at a Rolls dealership, everybody that comes in the Rolls dealership, there's a higher probability of, other than I send you to go out, smell the leather and Rolls, which has fucked up the whole system here since we uh, uh, ordered the new Rolls 
And uh, they know, all know about uh, Smother Leather. Every Rolls dealer in, in England, in Scotland knows, there's only one in Scotland, knows about the fuck, because we had mooches like you coming in, and, it, and they, there, there's two systems of selling cars. There's an up system, meaning you sold the last, you had the last prospect, and so you get the next prospect, and you get the next prospect. And then there's every man for themselves uh, method, which I like better, uh, where you just, when you see me, you drag them in and you sell them. Well, it, it, it fucked up the up system because maybe two guys in a day would come in to smell the leather, and those were your two opportunities. And in rolls, is they don't, there are not that many people that come into the showroom. So I'm taking the ability to make put, uh, food on your table. So when we were down at the factory uh, down in southern England, oh yeah, they, they knew me. They, uh, but they didn't know I was a trillion dollar man. The, they knew the 50, the, some, he didn't say asshole, but some guy, 50 billion dollar man, is that you? He says, yeah, that was me. Um, okay, what else about Mr. Carnegie? Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, well, I understood that he was not only at the very beginning, but also later on pretty frugal. Yeah. Well, I mean, Scots, Scottish people are, are frugal. They're very close to the money. They're not the only ones. But, um, yeah, he, he did get uh, frugal. But, you know, you, um, uh, his mom driv drove him. His mom was embarrassed. He, she wanted to come back and ride in a carriage through the town. Uh, when they took the looms away, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, it, it broke uh, the heart of the dad. I don't know if it broke the heart of the mom. Uh, but he had seen, and, they were, and that was a pretty wealthy um, profession in those days. So he had seen as a little kid... You know, they were wealthy, to then they were poor, and then they were in the, you know, in the belly of the boat when they went uh, back to the United States. Um, but he um, pivoted, the old man pivoted, um, and a lot of people could make a living in Europe during the, the potato, uh, 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 what do you call it? Not fathom. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you'll see some of you that are going to start in one area will morph, almost not all of you, but at least half of you will morph within your area, uh, meaning staying in the same vertical and half of you will change and go into uh, uh, another area. Not, and that's fine, but even at that, most people hang on too long. It shouldn't take you, if you don't like bedpans, or if you don't like dentistry, or if you don't like whatever, we've got people rolling up uh, Pilates studios. Uh, if you don't like that, it gets older quicker. And that's why I say all of you should go into something that, uh, uh, that you have some sort of passion for.